Welcome to lecture three on local governments. We've covered county governments, and we've covered city and municipal governments, and now we're going to talk about special purpose districts. Now, special purpose district is a unit of local government that performs a single service in a limited geographical area. A special district can be created to serve an entire county or multiple counties. It can provide services such as education or sanitation. In Texas, the number of special districts increased from 491 in 1952 to over 2,600 by 2012, and we're just, you know, it increases all the time. In addition, there are over 1,265 independent school districts, which are also classified as a special purpose district. Now, these districts can be created to do almost anything that's legal under the Texas State Constitution. Special districts can be created to serve, you know, multiple counties, part of a county, two or more counties, or etc. Now, the number of special districts, not including uh, school districts, are more than uh, any other form of local government in Texas. These are sometimes referred to as hidden governments because they have the ability to tax you or charge you a fee. Now there are basically two types of uh, special districts that are loosely classified as either a school district or a non-school district. Some of the non-school district examples are municipal utility districts, economic development corporations, hospital districts, college districts, one problem is with these districts is local government officials sometimes they work in a relative obscurity thus they're able to avoid scrutiny that's hence that's why they're called hidden governments so let's talk about the school districts every inch of land in texas is part of some school districts the textbook states there are over 1265 of these some are big some are small each school district is governed by an elected board of trustees they could range from five to nine members now the school board employs a superintendent to oversee the operation and you know the superintendent sometimes recommends the trustees the school board sets the overall policy for the school district this policy includes the budget, what they're going to set the property tax rate, what textbooks they're going to use in class, the school calendar, what days are we going to have off, and when are we going to start school. Now, all of these can be very controversial, especially if you have children in school and, you know, you have to work around their schedule. And then there's the non-school districts. There are many, many types of these non-school special districts. For instance, Harris County that covers Houston has 436 non-school special districts. Some examples of these include municipal utility districts called MUDs. They basically, if you live outside, outside of a city and you need things like trash pickup or water or things like that, you know, sewage, you can create a non-school district or special district to basically take care of those things like that. We have community college districts, hospital districts, emergency services districts, flood control districts. Now, the MUD districts can do things like electricity, water, sewage, and sanitation. Community college districts are considered non-school districts because they do not offer K through 12 public education. But a community college is like in, in our area, we have Vernon College, and if you're from certain counties around Wichita and Wilbarton County, you have to get a tuition break because your taxes go to help support that community college. But if you live outside of those, it's almost like you're going out of state, like you have to pay out of state tuition. Now, these districts, these non-school districts are governed by, uh, again, an elected board of regents, and the board will employ, you know, an executive to take care of the main policy, like for the, in the instance, the community college, you have a president or a chancellor, 
and the regents set the overall policy, tax rate, tuition, and fees, etc. How do you create and how do you govern and how do you finance a special district? Now, creation of a special district begins with a petition that's signed by the residents of the area to be served. The petition signed by the residents request that the legislature authorize the election to create the special district, thus enabling legislation in the form of a law that authorizes a special election. And then you have a majority of positive votes must be returned in this special election. Now, most special districts are governed by boards that are elected by voters in that district. Property taxes are the primary source of revenue. This is a tax based on the assessment of the value of one's property, which is then used to fund the services provided by the local governments, such as, you know, like the education. Uh, other, like the MUDs, have uh, what they call user fees, which is the second largest source of income. State and federal aid furnish the remainder. This is a fee for, you know, the services that they provide. They come pick up your trash, uh, da, 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 da. Now, special districts are also called hidden governments. Now, there are some problems with the special districts that include the potential for abuse. They're among the least studied areas of Texas politics. Private gains by developers could suggest a greater scrutiny is needed. Now, the creation of special purpose districts by real estate developers has sometimes been controversial. Recent investigations have charged developers with abusing the process in order to circumvent inconvenient laws and to give the developers greater control over taxes and other government functions in the district. Now we have councils of government. Councils of government are one of the greatest problems facing local governments is coordination across boundaries. The Texas legislature passed something called the Regional Planning Act that provided for the creation of these so-called regional councils of government that helps to promote coordination. There are 24 regional councils of government in Texas today. Um, they do things like planning for economic development, pollution control, flooding control, or drug enforcement. Um, you know, because these problems don't cease to exist once you get outside the city limits, once you leave the county government. So basically, they're created to help increase the, uh, the chances of, you know, coordinating and look at district one there it is the panhandle regional planning commission uh here in wichita falls we are in three which is the north texas regional planning commission now what are some of the issues that face local governments today well the different local governments in texas often raise money through specific or special mechanisms one is called the capital appreciation bond which is used primarily by school districts to raise revenue for development in times of rapid population growth it's a long term and high yield meaning the people that buy it will hold on to the bonds for a while but they pay out pretty good now controversy has emerged over the large debt that's taken on by the issuer or the you know the special district and over poor accountability the capital appreciation bond pays off both principal and interest in one lump sum when the bond reaches its maturity. The issue of accountability comes into play when the debt that appears on the, in other words, people take, people want a new school, so they finance through the capital appreciation bonds, but the people who push the bonds in the first place are not going to be in office when the bond actually has to be paid. Now another problem is local pensions. Austin, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio could collectively face $22.6 billion worth of pension fund shortfalls according to a new report. Now this analysis is based on how big the looming pension shortfalls are compared to the annual revenues in which each city 
entity operates. According to the report, the North Texas City has an unfunded pension liability of $7.6 billion. That is, that's for Dallas. This is more than five times the city's 2015 operating revenues. Houston has a $10 billion shortfall. Austin, $2.7 billion. San Antonio, $2.3 billion. How did they get in this, this problem? How did they get in this shortfall? Well, the recession hit several of these public pension funds especially hard. To shore up the ailing budgets during those years, many government entities stopped or reduced their contributions to the pension funds that worsened the financial problem. Meanwhile, some funds overestimated growth rates, which compounded the situation even more. Dallas's police officer and firefighter retirement fund has long been plagued with problems. It lost $196 million in 2014 due to risky real estate investments. Um, the, the fund's top staffer resigned amidst some of the growing concerns about how the fund was managed and the fund was sued by its advisors who were also served no, the fund sued its advisors who were also served with a search warrant by the FBI. So that's a, that's a problem. The, so, and I don't know why I have two slides there, but anyway, it's a financial crisis. Local government affects the average citizen's life much, much more than either the federal or state government, which is why we study it.